It's telling the North Koreans, we're focused on the nuclear weapons problem. What we really need is a complete, you know, all-out economic warfare against North Korea. Our sanctions? Our sanctions are useless. Well, the only it? thing that works is China sanctions. The North Koreans are really going between friendly ports, right? Yeah. Russia, China. And what is a huge success of the Trump administration is to get China basically on board, not 100%. President Trump talked about Russia backfilling uh, sanctions implementation by China. Why is North Korea interested in cryptocurrencies? It's a very wild area. They're gamblers. They're in a tough spot. From the Voice of America, this is Washington Talk. Hello and welcome to Washington Talk. I'm Eun Jung Cho. The Treasury Department applied fresh sanctions on North Korea, targeting entities and individuals helping to finance or support the country's weapons development. This is the ninth round of U.S. unilateral sanctions on North Korea since President Trump took office. towards credible negotiations on denuclearization. Now my guest today, Mr. Anthony Ruggiero, Senior Fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. He spent more than 17 years in the U.S. government as an expert in targeted financial measures. Also joining me, Mr. William Brown, professor at the Georgetown University. Professor Brown spent four decades in the U.S. government, including the CIA and the Commerce Department, focusing on North Korean and Chinese economies. Welcome to both of you. It's great to be here. Good morning. Bill, let me begin with you. What was the most notable about the latest round of sanctions on North Korea? It's the most interesting thing about the sanctions is the timing of them. Mm -hmm. Usually our sanctions have come following a North Korean provocation of some sort. Mm -hmm. If anything, right now, the North Koreans are on a uh, nice track. They're trying to, you know, come to the Olympics. So for us to uh, put in sanctions now, I think it's giving a bit of a different message. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I like the message because I think it's telling the North Koreans, whatever they do, uh, we're focused on the nuclear weapons problem and mm -hmm. the missiles problem. It's not just the Olympics. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're still working on missiles and nuclear materials, mm -hmm. we're going to sanction. Anthony, what do you think about the timing of the sanctions? Well, I agree. I mean, I think the timing is exactly right. It shows that the maximum pressure policy continues. As for that, the sanctions themselves, they included commercial networks overseas for an entity mostly in China, apparently, mm -hmm. uh, that was sanctioned in 2009. And then also the financial representatives have bank accounts in China. And so for me, it's what's included, but then what's not included. Chinese banks were not targeted. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably going to be the next set of sanctions. Mm -hmm. And then the surprising thing for me was that Russia was not targeted, given mm -hmm. that last week mm -hmm. President Trump talked about China back, or excuse me, Russia backfilling mm -hmm. uh, sanctions implementation by China. So I think there's a lot more there. Mm -hmm. And so we should expect more sanctions, probably even through the Olympics. Mm -hmm. I think the individuals were seem to be mostly or maybe all North Koreans who are living in China seem mm -hmm. like that. Right. I think what the Treasury Department is trying to do is they're trying to describe a network, particularly for China, mm -hmm. and to say, uh, you know, September Executive Order 13810, mm -hmm. which prohibits trade with North Korea or with designated entities. Mm -hmm. I think that the, Tr the Trump administration is trying to describe for China, this is the network, and if your banks don't stop Mm -hmm. activities with that network, then you're, you're, the banks themselves are going to be sanctioned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the Trump administration is naming these companies, Chinese companies, so that the Chinese government can also make, take some measures. But how is the level of cooperation from the Chinese government on this? Well, I mean, there was reporting that uh, the Trump administration uh, talked to the Chinese government before these actions. I think that always happens. Uh, but, you know, the Chinese government uh, at some level has been acting against North Koreans inside China, but clearly they haven't done enough. If there are representatives of an entity that was, de North Korean entity that was designated in 2009 still operating in China, that's a problem. Uh, and it just shows you how the Chinese are willing to look the other way 
And the issue really here is there were two Chinese companies that were also sanctioned uh, earlier this week. But the question is, is when, when, when is the Trump administration going to go to the next, next level? Because this isn't just pressure, it's maximum pressure. Mm -hmm. And what we really need is a complete, you know, all-out economic warfare against North Korea. Mm -hmm. Bill, what, what are your thoughts about Chinese level of cooperation? You know, I'm, I'm thrilled, actually. I think in the, up until about a year ago, uh, the November UN sanctions, up until then, I thought China was not playing games with us. Or they were playing games, but they weren't really uh, intent on sanctioning North Korea. But in the last year, I follow the trade quite, quite closely and, mm -hmm. and what they say about it. And uh, I think there's been a 180-degree turn on the Chinese part. Uh, they used to say, you know, and the Russians too, we don't want to hurt the North Korean economy. We just want to focus on the missiles and the, and the uh, nuclear weapons people. Mm -hmm. um, they're not really saying that anymore. And they're, the Chinese especially are uh, putting in sanctions that are hurting the North Korean economy mm -hmm. very dramatically. Anthony, you mentioned about Chinese banks. Until now, the only Chinese financial institution that has been designated was the Bank of Dandong. Do you think more Chinese banks should be designated? Absolutely. I think that the North Koreans are clearly uh, able to do financial transactions in Chinese banks, including with, U with U.S. dollars, meaning it's coming through the U.S. financial system. There was actually an ac action on Thursday uh, by the Justice Department to uh, uh, attempt to uh, forfeiture or seize 500,000 more from Chinese individuals. And so I think you're going to see more in that regard. And the only thing on China, I mean, certainly they might be doing more on trade uh, and they might be doing more on North Koreans. But the difference here is that we know there are Chinese nationals and Chinese firms and Chinese banks aiding North Korea. And until the Chinese on their own act against those individuals and those firms and those banks, they're never going to be doing enough. And they're really going to risk their own access to the U.S. financial system. And that's really the lever here. Do the Chinese value their relationship with the United States more than they do North Korea? And really, in the end, they will make the same choice that everyone made on Iran, which is they are going to choose the United States and not the Kim regime. Mm -hmm. Moving on to vessels, Bill, uh, six vessels have been designated this time around. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the South Korean government and Japanese governments recently uncovered many cases of illegal ship-to-ship -ship transfers mm -hmm. involving yeah. North Korean vessels. Yeah. Why the rise in illegal ship-to-ship -ship transfers? Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of funny, but I think that shows you, it's almost a proof that the sanctions are working. Um, especially if you think about coal. Coal is a very low value. It's basically rocks that you move from one place to another. Uh, to have to do that in the middle of the Yellow Sea, transferring ship to ship, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. It just raises the cost, lowers the profits. Mm -hmm. You would never do that unless there's some major constraint on normal trade. Mm -hmm. There are reports that they're turning to African vessels now. It's, I'm, I'm thinking they don't have many other choices. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. A lot of the Asian mm -hmm. shippers must be getting the message. Mm -hmm. They'll never all learn the message, but um, it's getting costly for them. Mm -hmm. Anthony, um, U.S. and its allies are moving to interdict uh, maritime traffic doing illegal business with North Korea. What will be the kinds of actions that will be included in the maritime interdiction? Right. I think, you know, the first step is going to be identifying more vessels. There's only about 60 that are currently identified by the Treasury Department. You know, we're tracking well over 200 uh, for 300 total. Uh, I think the next step on interdiction really needs to be, so the UN resolutions, the standard is reasonable grounds. And so the, the theory has been you have to have reasonable grounds that there's an item on that vessel that's a violation of UN sanctions. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, what I would hope we'll, we will see is that a, like, a, group, a small group of like-minded countries will turn that on its head and say every North Korea link, not North Korea flag, but every North Korea linked vessel there's reasonable grounds to inspect it. How is the latest idea of maritime interdiction similar or different from the previous um, PSI, Proliferation Security Initiative, during the Bush administration? I think it's very similar. I think PSI was focused, you know, mostly on proliferation. I think now we're into commodities. Certainly that revenue goes to their proliferation programs. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think they're going to use some of those same, uh, if there was a, 
There was a statement earlier this month from the from some of the PSI countries about North Korea interdiction. Mm -hmm. I think there's more and more focus on it. There's there's the the category of do an interdiction, but then also do some of these exercises. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all about for insurance companies and for legitimate vessels. It's about raising the risk profile, and they're not going to be you know they're not going to want to do these shipments. They're certainly not going to want to do ship to ship transfers. Which are going to be, which are dangerous mm -hmm. and really not economical. Mm -hmm. But well, you know, mm -hmm. there is a uh, a big difference, I think, with the PSI. PSI mm -hmm. was, and is still, aimed basically at stopping uh, fissile material, chemicals, dan really dangerous weapons, mm -hmm. terrorist kind of use of them. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what's changed with North Korea. Again, as I say, just in the last year, it's become much more of an economic target. Mm -hmm. Certainly, we want to stop fissile material and missiles. I'm a little worried because I haven't seen any interdictions. We used to see ships being stopped carrying missiles. Now maybe hopefully they're not doing that anymore. But um, it's a whole other ball game if you're talking about steel and coal and iron ore and that kind of thing. Um, well, I mean, that we, the interdictions, you know, uh, as I say, with the weapon stuff you want to be close to 100%. Mm -hmm. With the economic stuff, you just want to raise the cost of it. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we have to move from the you have to be 100 yeah. uh, percent. With North Korea, given the UN resolutions, we're at a point where all of those vessels really should be subject to inspection. Uh, and yeah, you're and basically that is the rule putting the, that they're the, supposed to be inspected. Right, you, you're putting the burden of fruit proof on those vessels, those vessels right. to say mm -hmm. that, I mean, given what we're seeing now is that the North Koreans are really going between friendly ports, right? Yeah. Russia, China, and their yeah. own ports. Yeah. And now you have that they're doing ship to ship transfers. You, there are reports, you know, the reports well, of I mean, the South Koreans. Well, I mean, you say Koreans. friendly ports, but don't forget China and Russia signed on board on this. So mm -hmm. they're not really friendly to North Korea in that well, way. Well, I guess we'll have to disagree on that. I, mean, well, I think they're both yes. very friendly ports. I mean, if yeah. they're not inspecting. And the issue here is going to be that U.S. sanctions are going to kick in. And if those ports mm -hmm. are not inspecting those vessels and, and are but violating this, this, sanctions, so they the, risk it. So we'll have to end this right, conversation right. here <laughs> and move on to our second topic. Mm -hmm. focused on illicit financing to North Korea in a wide spectrum of, of areas. Of course, cryptocurrency is one of them. We have to remain vigilant in making sure that North Korea is not using the international financial system. This week, Siegel Mandelker, Treasury's Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, told Congress that the Treasury is focused on illicit financing to North Korea in a wide spectrum of areas, including cryptocurrency. Lately, cybersecurity companies pointed to North Korean involvement in cryptocurrency attacks. Now, Anthony, let me begin with you. What were the kinds of cryptocurrency attacks linked with North Korea recently? Well, certainly there have been reports that uh, North Korea has gone after Bitcoin uh, companies that they've uh, that they've tried to mine Bitcoin uh, that would go back to North Korea. You know, I really see that North Korea is engaged in cyber-enabled economic warfare, really in three areas. The first is this area to to get money to really uh, help blunt the impact of sanctions. The second area is more of a military area uh, where they want to use cyber-enabled economic warfare. Uh, against U U.S. forces Korea and South Korea forces and maybe even the infrastructure here in the United States. And then the third is really a political uh, hack, which is what we saw with the Sony hack in 2014. There were reports that they hacked uh, a U.K. production company. Mm -hmm. so, they, so they have a wide-ranging cyber yeah, capability South that's Korean only also, getting yeah. in. Uh, and then also, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the South Korean right. banks yeah. and South Korean uh, you know, companies. So, so they're they're using it in a wide wide range of areas, and they've really been under the radar improving their cyber capabilities. Mm -hmm. Bill, why is North Korea interested in cryptocurrencies? Well, I mean, I think if if you look, if there's one currency that's worse than a Bitcoin, I think it's the North Korean won. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're used to playing with bad money in a way. Uh, I don't know that much about Bitcoins. I don't 
quite understand them. I don't, uh, there's a lot of gambling involved, mm -hmm. a lot of um, illicit activity, a way to get away from taxes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a big defender of bitcoins, and if people play that game, I think they're playing a re very risky game. Mm -hmm. To so not just North Koreans, but any, if, if a North Korean can hack it, I think somebody in our neighborhood can hack it too, you know, <laughs> and they can make money. So mm -hmm. it's a very wild area. Mm -hmm. uh, North Koreans naturally play in that because they're gamblers. Mm -hmm. They're in a tough spot. <laughs> they don't have a lot to lose. Mm -hmm. The most dangerous thing about North Korea, though, in this at it, is it's kind of a sanctuary. Mm -hmm. You can't go into North Korea. Their government doesn't police it. Their government probably helps with it. Mm -hmm. So you, it's a sanctuary for these people to, to gamble and uh, uh, very dangerously that way. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really sure how we can stop that. Mm -hmm. Anthony, what are um, Treasury's measures to monitor and guard against the um, illicit activities by rogue nations on these uh, cryptocurrency activities? Well, you know, I think there has been some uh, regulations with regard to the United States with uh, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and and others, and I think you're seeing some countries like South Korea and others uh, start to look at that for money, as Bill said, for anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing issues, making sure that terrorists and proliferators and money launderers don't use Bitcoin uh, to avoid the regulations you would see in the banking system. But in terms of the broader cyber issue, yeah. uh, there's a cyber executive order that could be used mm -hmm. uh, there, with, re with regard to North Korea. There's already sanctions with regard to North Korea's cyber activities. And of course, one of the executive orders came after the 2014 uh, a hack of Sony Pictures mm -hmm. Entertainment. Mm -hmm. Bill, what is the level of North Korea's cyber capabilities? Uh, it's clearly pretty good. And uh, a lot of times people are wondering how could they be good at it? But again, it's partly it's a sanctuary idea. I think smart kids, smart young people can figure this out. And you get a group of them together. It's rare uh, in the West, I think, or in South Korea, that you can have a group of people working uh, on a project. North Korea, they can work as a group, a team, 10 or 20 person team. They go over to China and work as a small team mm -hmm. to get access to the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's this teamwork that they're able to do not because they're smarter, um, but because they're not regulated, they're not enforced. So that's, to me, the danger of it. It's an asymmetrical way for mm -hmm. North Korea mm -hmm. to attack the United States and South Korea without using weapons, without mm -hmm. using missiles or, mm -hmm. or bullets or bombs. They can mm -hmm. use cyber to, to really harm both countries. Mm -hmm. We'll end this conversation here and move on to our next segment. Now time for the photo moment, a time to look at an interesting North Korea picture. The photo today is a North Korean military parade. North Korea is set to hold a military parade on February 8th, marking the foundation date of the Korean People's Army. Now, this is just the day before the opening ceremony of South Korea's Pyeongchang Olympics. North Korea changed this date this year to February 8th from April, prompting speculations as to why they changed the date. Satellite images also revealed North Korea is already preparing for the parade. Now, Anthony, what is your reaction to this photo? Well, I think this photo and the parade itself really shows how the inter-Korean talks are really not serious. I think that the North Koreans are just trying to play they're trying to sabotage the maximum pressure campaign and drive a wedge between South Korea and the United States. Mm -hmm. And this, this is really evidence of it. Doing a military parade the day before the Olympics when, when we delayed our own, the U.S. and South Korea delayed its own military exercises, this is just right in your face mm -hmm. of President Moon and President Trump. Mm -hmm. Bill? I would say this parade is aimed at the North Korean people mm -hmm. because the, uh, if you think about it, the Olympics business is worrisome, I think, to North Korea. Mm -hmm. I like the Olympics. I like North Korea coming to the Olympics because it gives a few North Koreans a glimpse of the outside world. But it's dangerous for him to, to open up that way. So he needs to show his own people that he's in charge. Mm -hmm. And this is Kim Jong-un in charge of this, of this military. Mm -hmm. So he, it's a propaganda tool, but I think it speaks to his weakness in North Korea that he has to go through this kind of mm -hmm. maneuver. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Bill, Anthony, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And this was Washington Talk from VOA, and I'm Eun Jung Cho. See you next week.